Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I guess we'll get started. Hi, oh, I love this group. They're all so sweet. <laughs> I'm gate crashing. <laughs> yep, I asked I asked Antusa could it come today. So instead of like me just trying to talk enough, <laughs> we thought we'd have like a conversation about the topic of death and dying. It's called dying for freedom, and we're gonna play with different ways of looking at that. But I think we usually start with meditation. So maybe I'll go ahead and maybe I can can do a little light guiding mm -hmm. and we'll we'll get started. Yeah, we all probably, we don't really need an intro. I think we've been here enough. They're all kind of used to and maybe getting tired of us. <laughs> so, we're in California. <laughs> we're it. still in California. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so please get comfortable. And this is going to be some guidance on we might say practicing for dying. So if you feel like lying down for this, feel free uh, to do that. And make yourself comfortable regardless of whatever posture you're in. Who knows what will be happening when it's actually time for each of us to pass away. But um, I know of people who have died in their favorite reclining chair and people who have died in their bed and, and in all other kinds of ways, but here today we get to choose. <laughs> and we don't want you to actually die if you could help it during this half an hour. <laughs> um, but you can if you need to, don't worry about it. Either. Yeah, it's all right, <laughs> certainly. Um, I really like um, what this monk uh, Venerable Upali, he was uh, a Thai monk who was a contemporary of Ajahn Mani. So back in the more early 20th century, I think. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> and he, um, he gave talks at a lot of funerals because he was like one of the head monks of, of the uh, monk hierarchy in Thailand, appointed by I think four or five different kings to be like the head of the forest sangha, that kind of thing. And he was at a he lived in a big monastery and they had a lot of funerals. And there was one time when he told people, don't be afraid of death. You're you're gonna need that when the time is right. Think of it as a friend. And he said, the time is right whenever it comes for you. It's, it's all right. Um, so he said, don't be afraid of it. And so we want to practice that. So then when the time comes, we have that friend um, that we can treat as a friend. And also, this is an excellent way to practice how to go into deep meditation. So we can use this all along the way. So <clears throat> finding your way to be comfortable. And if, if you're comfortable paying attention to your breathing, then bring your attention to your breath. Otherwise, whatever other way you're comfortable focusing, if it's on your hands or your belly or your feet or some feeling of where you're sitting on the chair or lying down, you know, whatever object or point of focus is useful for you, you can use that. But I use the breath and many people do. And of course, the breath is something you'll have as you're dying until it's over. Until it's complete.
So we just gently settle and relax the body. So with an attitude of letting go of any stress, If there are pleasant feelings, and see if you can feel them detached. If they come, they go. If there are painful feelings or uncomfortable feelings, and see if you can feel them detached without any clinging, without any aversion. Just letting them arise and cease as they will. We're here at the very beginning of meditation. You can adjust your posture a little bit if that helps to relieve any stress or pain. I want you to take in the perceived reality at this moment that you are actively dying. You know that there isn't anything left to do. Nothing's really going to happen now except the release and relief of the various bodily functions and the release and relief of the perceptions and attachments in the mind. You might even reflect on how there is no future beyond this short period as the body winds down to its end. You might notice some relief about that. <clears throat> Nothing you have to think about or do. Nothing to prepare for. Continue to observe the breath as long as the breath is there.
There are various burdens that we can put down at this point. The first one you can reflect on, which is fairly straightforward, is to let go of any ownership of the things that you've gathered in your life. Maybe a house or a car or <clears throat> other possessions. Just reflect on the fact that they are no longer yours. You leave them behind for someone else to take care of. They are free from that. Just letting go. Letting go of things. And we can reflect on letting go of those things we feel responsible for. Our work. Those things that we take care of. Our activities.
in all those places where we show up during our life. Home, work, groups we belong to, hobbies we, we engage in. Now you won't be there. And it's like what they say when they take a boat out of the water. No mark, no sign is left. Before long, that's how it will be. Peaceful. Letting go of any sense of responsibility or ownership, any requirements. When we start to let go of attachment to people, letting go of our friends, our parents, they may have already gone on. So the letting go happened. But if they're still alive, letting go of our attachment to them, letting go of our children, our partners, we can still love them. But with this very rich universal love, letting go of attachment, letting go of requirements for those relationships. And the journey you are going to take after the last breath is completely on your own. And noticing how that feels. And you carry with you all the good karma, all the, the actions that shape the direction of your forward progress. and gratitude for the beautiful roles that people have played in your life. And warm wishes for their well-being and benefit for them.
They have their own paths, their own purposes. We may meet again at some point. Leaving them now is fine. Doing it without any regret, without any longing or aversion. And the same goes for our furry friends, the pets. That sometimes play such a significant role in our lives. And may they be well. <clears throat> may they also someday awaken. And finally, we have to let go of everything we think we are. 
the body. It's rapidly dying. It never was ours anyway. And now we can let it go through the process. It knows how to do it on its own. We can observe and bear with the discomfort if there is some. And let go of all attachment to it. is bit by bit shutting down. We don't need to try to slow that process or speed it up, just observe. Knowing this is the way things are for every living being. There comes that time. okay. Well, it's a good and useful body for the practice. And now it's time to go. But what might be a little bit more difficult is letting go of our perceptions of ourself, the roles we've played, who we think we are mentally, psychologically. Letting go of our preferences, letting go of our self-image, Letting go of our identity. Letting go of identifying with anything. Being a mother, a father, brother, sister, aunt or uncle. Boss or employee, teacher or student. whatever labels we've had throughout our life. The wise person, the kind person, the foolish person, the angry person, it doesn't matter. We can let them all go. They never really defined us anyway. And come to a point of not wanting anything, not wanting to get rid of anything because there's nothing left to let go of. All there is is peace, freedom for things to change as they will, freedom from having to carry any burden.
Welcome back. I hope you could hear that. I get a little quiet sometimes. <laughs> we'll be interested in hearing what you thought of that meditation. We thought we would just have a conversation about dying for freedom and then loop you all in to join us. Um, yeah. <laughs> you want to start or do you want? I don't know. Sure. Um, well, I mean, we were looking at this in two ways. So like dying for freedom, there's the Ajahn Shah style when, when he's giving a Dhamma talk and he asks the new monastics who come, like, are you ready to die? You know, because <laughs> they're, they're signing up to give their life to the practice and kind of very gung-ho, like put everything into it. You've got hardcore, just practice, practice, practice till you get enlightened or die trying. And most of us can't, can't, you know, it's a bit much. <laughs> For, for most of us to handle. So um, there's a lot of value in that. And we know a lot of Thai forest masters who that, that is a good thing for them culturally too, because they do need a little bit more fire. And sometimes in the West, we need a little less fire because we tend to beat ourselves up instead. Um, oh, I'm not doing it enough. I'm not doing it right. You know, I have to go harder and be more austere and give up this and that and the other and then it ends up being too much and it, it kind of ruins the kind of what the buddha advised to do really in the end it's not really following his teachings the same way the buddha did all the austerities and it didn't really do it for him either <laughs> so <laughs> you know you have to have to find the right way to do it so there's that kind of dying for freedom and then there's the other kind of dying for freedom where you can do a lot of death reflection and that can get you enlightened. And we see that in the suttas too, where monks have gotten enlightened by reflecting on death a lot. And even modern day people who are known to be arahants, some of them, that's their main practice or that was their main practice as well. It's like reflecting on death almost constantly or pretty much constantly. And that's really like a driving force to help us to see like the nature of reality and see what we're really dealing with in samsara and um it helps us let go and, and not cling to the stuff that's keeping us here and wanting to come back after we die and that probably would have been my whole talk <laughs> so i'm glad she's here <laughs> yeah i was thinking about also the the Another way to think of that dying for freedom mm -hmm. is how I know I came to, to a place in my life where I was really desperate to find answers and um, really, you know, you really at some point are ready to give up what you've been um, pursuing and struggling with in your life because you're you want to find uh, something better you want to find that relief from from dukkha from suffering and uh, so you can have a pretty strong push um, i think a lot of the sangwega the energy the urgency can come from really really seeing that our life is lacking something important or there's really a lot of um, intense desire to to really find a better way. Before we came on, before we came into the room with everyone, um, some of us were talking in the in the back, and Shirley mentioned this uh, kind of thought of um, how wonderful it is to reflect on how we have no future, and. You know, when you think I have no future, how that changes the way we're feeling in this moment, you know, like sitting down for meditation instead of instead of um, the instruction being set the future aside, that can be hard to do. But if you really think oh, I have no future, 
because we don't know what's going to happen. That might be another way that the mind warms up to more or um, is more um, kind of urged by, let's say. And it reminded me of a story, someone who um, has been a frequent visitor at our Vihara in the past, not, not so much since COVID, but he's Vietnamese and he um, was a, a young man in his 20s, I think, during the Vietnam War. And in his, his home was in South Vietnam and he and his brothers tried to escape by boat and, um, and they were turned back and then they tried again. And um, this time he was thrown into a North Vietnamese prison camp and the conditions were horrible. I mean, they, the guards tortured the people who were there and he was, um, given the job of cleaning up the human waste every day. And um, he said that, you know, there's not much food and there's not, he didn't get much water to like to clean himself. He said he'd have to bathe part of half his body one day and the other half another day. And, you know, just um, really rough. But he said, for some weird reason, he was so happy. And he felt it was because he didn't know if he would live until tomorrow. He didn't have a future. And he said that feeling of not having a future somehow really brought happiness. And I, I suggested to him, I really think this is it. He was connecting to the Dhamma. It was really an inspiration of Dhamma that was there um, in that awful situation. And he said, it didn't take long before the guards said, don't bother torturing him. He, there isn't anything you can do to him. <laughs> and, uh, and he said there was another man there who would, kept being angry and saying harsh things to the guards. And of course they're tormenting him like crazy. And, and he just, he looks back on this time in a very kind of fond way. Um, just that, that lifting of his heart in that situation where he didn't know what at all would come next. And he did eventually escape, and he did escape Vietnam. The third try uh, to leave on the boat worked. And then when we met him, he's working in high tech in Silicon Valley, and he said, I wish I could have that again. <laughs> so no, quite well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> now I'm worried about things. I'm I've got got a family, and I'm worried about them, and I'm worried about you know all these responsibilities I have. And you know, I, I wish I could recapture that. <laughs> so anyway, it's just a thought of like, can we really reflect on how we don't know what's coming in the future? Can we be a little less um attached to making things turn out the way we want them to or um feeling oppressed by our our obligations yeah i love that i love that like all you really have to do is take out the the toilet bucket you know and it's like not a nice job but we're kind of all doing some version of that all day anyway. We all have to do things we don't want to do <laughs> I think I that like. are not pleasant to do. And we have to do it all day long anyway. But like if we don't have to worry about the future, it's it's way less stressful. You know, it's like it's a simple thing. It's just do this one task, this one thing at a time kind of thing. And it's like you don't have to worry if like the door never gets fixed the next day or you know, this needs fixing or changing or doing or whatever you don't have to like stress out about it in the future you know because right now all you're doing is this one thing that needs to be done and you're not um adding stress to anything you know like you don't have to worry about the future that may never come I love Ajahn Brahm's thing about like don't don't do it don't put off 
or don't do today what you can put off to tomorrow because you don't know if you're going to die. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> I don't like it. I mean, of course, we're really practical people. It's not like you never <laughs> plan anything. Yeah. And it's not like you don't have your to-do list. But how can we let go of the attachment to it and the stress over mm -hmm. it? And really, I think one thing that death has brought into my life when I've lost people that I love is is an understanding that um, my priorities are very different when I hold in mind that I might not see them again, you know, or, or, you know, all the things that we take as serious, which are really pretty meaningless, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you don't care if your socks match, you know, it's like, <laughs> anyway. I think it's time for you to say something. We've got got on a little bit. <laughs> Any thoughts or questions? Like, how do you two ever manage in the world, <laughs> <laughs> James? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. The thing I found with the meditation is that it reminds me that um, sometimes in life you don't know how you're going to react to a situation until it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So just imagining the situation is sort of different because, you know, I, I kind of feel like... Um, Um, you know, I'm not, not too bothered about the idea of death, you know, like, a, you know, almost welcome the idea. It's like, <laughs> it's, I mean, as some, someone who hasn't found a lot of sort of happiness in life, I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, particularly, particularly if, you know, rebirth is a thing, then I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, it's like, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully with all this practice, then maybe the next girl will be better um so maybe death is something to look forward to really i mean um mm -hmm. but i wonder whether maybe i'm deluded you know it's like i was maybe this sounds a bit gruesome but during the meditation i was imagining like what if say somehow i'd got injured and i was sort of bleeding profusely and like um you know just feeling weaker and weaker and feeling it coming and everything like i say in my, my in my imagination I'll be like, all oh, right, okay, <laughs> see what happens next, kind of thing. But will it really be like that when the time comes? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I think it's good to keep the who knows in there, but mm. it feels to me like when we practice something, we've got a better chance hmm. of responding in that way. And I think it's great your attitude <laughs> setting up the expectation <laughs> yeah you know like just kind of like creating a bit of a pattern you know i mean if we've got this pattern of being present in the moment and kind of going okay well there's this now <laughs> and let's see how it goes and you know then i think it's more likely we'll have that attitude in the end hmm. of this I mean, it's not the end of the end unless you've gotten enlightened and then woohoo, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's always another beginning. Um, I really like, what was that? I was going to talk about um, endings. You know, I did a thing on endings one of the Saturday mornings and we were, we were driving home from maybe one of the teachings we were giving. And I said, I uh, Chitananda, you know, I want, I want to talk about endings. What should I say? And she said, well, the ultimate ending is Nibbana. And all other endings are just the beginning of something else. So get out of samsara now. <laughs> <laughs> and that would have been my whole talk. <laughs> yeah, it was a great starter for me. <laughs> I, I do remember you saying that one, actually. It's... Uh... Mm. that's a good one but i think i think sometimes i annoy people because my, my mum's like um 80 now and she's mm. just obsessed i was i booked a concert i was offered to book a concert for her we had a choice between may and september she chose may because she's like i might not make it till september 
And there's like nothing wrong with her, really. She's quite healthy for her age. So I think I aggravate her sometimes because I have a really kind of like, <laughs> you know, just just sort of a joking, non-serious sort of attitude to bear. Mm-hmm. She's got a holiday next week and she was troubled about getting travel insurance. Like, what if I die out there? How are you going to get me back? So I say, well, I'll just stuff you in a suitcase and fly you back. And she didn't take that well. <laughs> oh, poor mom. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You never know. It might be lightening her heart, even though she's resisting. <laughs> I, well, that's my hope that maybe if I'm just a little bit, what do you call it? This, not disrespectful, but I don't know. May, maybe it'll rub off a bit. Maybe she won't stress about it quite so much because she does. So. Yeah, well, and if I think of the alternative, what if you go, oh, yeah, oh, no, you could die up there. <laughs> what would I do? And no, she doesn't need that. <laughs> I think you've got the right approach. <laughs> yeah. He knew a guy who was in a really, really bad car accident. And he he did have kind of that experience James was talking about earlier. It's like he, he flipped over several times and like he was about to like head on, like hit something um like right into him like a tree or something and and he was thinking he kind of he said he smiled to himself he's like oh this is how it ends you know it's like he was um he said he felt really peaceful and ready and okay and he was like smiling to himself like oh i kind of wondered how this was gonna end this is how it ends you know <laughs> and that's a good way to go <laughs> it's an accepting you're not like fighting the pain you're not scared you're not freaking out about you know I don't know what else he could have been thinking about worried about his loved ones or whatever but it's a very gentle kind of acceptance and knowing that this this is not the end this time for him he was a big I think rebirth person (laughs) he seems to be a big rebirth person so see that changes it too it makes it easier in some ways too if you know yeah yeah it's not really the end and yeah i've been reading a bit about near-death experiences recently or a tv program and uh yeah it looks pretty good really and and um i think ajahn brahm said a while ago that um obviously his descriptions of um entering first jhana and imita and you know going to the light and everything he said it's very it seems very similar to some of these near-death experiences and so he sort of thinks that although you might not get to experience first jhana in this life, sooner or later everybody will. So <laughs> maybe, maybe I just have that in the back of my mind that that well, you know if if you do die, then you've probably got some quite nice things to look forward to. It's um and and I've, I've heard in drowning, for example, people who've survived drowning say that initially it's rather unpleasant as you imagine, but there's this point where you just sort of like let go and realize that it's happening and it's not that bad afterwards so uh yeah yeah maybe that's why i look forward to it a bit too much you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, won't, it wouldn't be the first time you died james and it probably won't be it might last, not be the last so <laughs> it might not be your last either <laughs> see <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i mean if you think about it, we've done this so many times we definitely know how how it goes you know it's like it's okay i think we can make it as easy as we want to in some ways at the actual yeah. moment of death anyway so that's my feeling yeah. i think that's why we should be prepared oh, yeah. that's good to be prepared it can be very very difficult but it can be very easy i just i think i think of the only person i've ever seen close to death which is my dad like a couple of hours before Mm-hmm. And he was struggling against it. I mean, maybe had discomfort of some kind, but you know, I kind of hope that when my time comes, I'll be a bit like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's different kinds of struggles. I mean, mm-hmm. there's the dealing with whatever the conditions are of the body, but then mm-hmm. there's the mental struggle. That's what we want to really mm-hmm. prepare us to avoid. And mm-hmm. I know uh, when one of my uncles was passing away. Um, his wife's sister so one of my other aunties was at his bedside and she said to him you know it's okay to let go and she said he looked at her with the most strange 
kind of look. And, and then after that, he just was peaceful and passed away. It was just that suggestion. It's okay to let go. That's pretty amazing, really. I worry about saying things like that to a dying person, though, because it might just scare, scare them, you know, like I'm almost sort of like, go on, push over the edge kind of thing, you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> well, <laughs> I think she knew him pretty well. <laughs> and yeah. she saw what we, he was doing. Yeah, and it's, it's permission, not encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what if you're saying that as you're you're reaching for the off switch on like the life support machine or something? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that, James. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Pulling the plug. Yeah. But I like the way you think. <laughs> I, think I think it's going to go well, James, for you. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm. Is there anyone else with a hand up yet? Yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, yeah. I thank see you. a couple. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to Darren. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, the meditation and the talk. And um, uh, it's something I've always struggled with. I think I'm quite relaxed about it, um, but. I still have so much attachment around it. My ex, um, over the last couple of years or so, she's had um, an illness that she's almost died from, and she's um, still, um, yeah, still not great, but she's living life um, and really embracing it and living, living each day. Um, and she's just come back from um, India from a, a two week yoga and meditation tree. And she had the most incredible, amazing time. And she's really embracing life um, because she genuinely, yeah, I mean, nobody knows, but I think with her experience over the last couple of years, it's she's been faced with her, her own mortality. Um, and I look at her and, and admire her um and um envious in some ways because i i spend my life um living in the future but living in the infinite um, realities or uh, paths that my future could go in and wondering which way it would go and then trying to bring myself back to the future but i, I work in an industry where we're planning all the time um, mm. And I'm thinking about the future, but trying to live in the present, but then thinking about the past and then I'm <laughs> spinning around. Um, and uh, it's, and it is the, it's not, it's not grasping or attachment to, to life, but it's trying to, I think, just let things be and just let things flow. And I suppose my question is um, how, <laughs> um to how to be in the moment um, and how to yeah how to be really how to enjoy yeah how to enjoy the moment and not worry about the future I think. Yeah. I think i think there's i think this is connected to i think what the main point is of practicing death reflection or really trying to bring that whole reality home to us uh, that we are, that we could die anytime, that we could die at any moment. And, you know, like you said, your ex is really, she's gotten it, you know, and, and the, the point in the practice for it is that we see the true nature of the body and we see the true nature of life so that we're not clinging to it or expecting it to be something it's not. It's actually full of impermanence to dukkha not self and then to really reflect on on death helps to you know kind of clear the delusion that we are constantly carrying as human beings almost constantly carrying and that that we're going to kind of live forever or as you know it's so far off in the distance and it causes us to really be in this kind of denial of reality and of, and of course, the goal of the path is that we see the truth so that we actually wake up. And I think this is what you're wanting. 
you know, how do I wake up? How do I wake up to the what, what's really happening now? How do I wake up to, you know, what our purpose is here? You know, instead of being just kind of bashed around by memories and desires and, you know, like cultural influences and whatever else comes along through our senses. And so how do we live in the moment? Well, maybe there is a space here for a kind of death reflection that really um, brings that reality home to your mind again and again and again so that when you're making choices about how to spend this moment you can make them in a way that's informed of the truth um, i'm going to recommend this talk that i i actually talked all day yesterday about it online and some of i don't know if any of you were there actually but on our website, karunabv.org, um, under teachings at the bottom of the menu, there's um, a page for this um, Samadhi to the Highest Goal is what it's called. And it's a talk given by a Thai forest monk named Dajan Blian back in 2004. I was in Australia and Melbourne and he was teaching there. And it made a huge impact on me. And he really talks a lot about how to go from meditation practice to the ultimate goal of, of realization of Nibbana. And a lot of what's in there, I think, would help answer your question. Like, how do I practice in a way that I'm really present here in this life with full awareness of what's um, what's actually happening and what, what I can do to be awake to this. Um, and so I hope that's useful. And, and I think the first thing to notice is that it's amazing that you are thinking like this. You know, most of the time, most people are just passing their life away or maybe there's a more crude way of saying that. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> You're just passing your life away without, without realizing what's going on. And then um, you're not doing that. Yeah, I think part of the problem is we're all walking around with this terminal diagnosis, basically, and we're just not looking at it. And your partner had the opportunity to have it really in her face so much. It really does. Yeah. It's it's such a strong insight, really. And then having that kind of insight changes how you look at everything else. So, yeah, practicing with it to gain that without the the disease part, <laughs> but just the fact that we're all terminal part too. Yeah, it felt, thank you so much for that. I wanted to re re look at that. Um, it just made me think and reflect more and think. Um, it it felt it feels as though she's had this huge liberation, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and able to just live life. And I, I've read so read somewhere um, that we we only die once, but we live every day, um, and. We just need to, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Nori? Thank you very much for that wonderful meditation. And it, um, I remember there was something similar by Ajahn Rahmali um that contemplation and um i started practicing kind of for about i think for a few weeks different mm -hmm. types of days what will happen and then okay i'm going to be this this and then you you feel that you're dying but then all these emotions like you know coming and then i kind of realize each time there is something there is a particular thing that 
I haven't finished it. And, you know, I get worried, like it's about my daughter who is only 20. So that's, that's kind of, I was thinking if I die, I might like that, 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 that's what I'm going to get worried about. And then, um, then I've heard like, you know, it is like, then how am I going to let go with, you know, this particular thing? And it's like a responsibility I haven't finished kind of. And then I remembered um, when my son was born, I kind of, that, that was my first child and I nearly died. And then I was like slowly kind of, you know, you know, like getting into a kind of a, sleep and then I was uh, thinking I really remember that oh I might die and it was really peaceful and then I was thinking oh there was a baby and what will happen to the baby and then I thought okay my sister's there that's fine she'll be able to look after and then the next day I was calling my sister you know you know this happened but now I got the daughter like you know if something happened to me can you come to come to UK and sort out all the stuff like the house and this and that like and she was, okay I'll do that you don't have to worry about I'm here uh -huh. <laughs> and then after that my meditation, meditation actually kind of you know and <laughs> calm and nice. <laughs> I thought I'll I'll share that experience with you. Yeah, that's great. That's, nice. that's great. <laughs> you know, there's a sutta of uh, Nikula Pita and Nikula Mata. That means like Mother Nikula and Father Nikula. And he is really, really sick and probably and looks like he's going to die. And she starts talking to him about all the things. He says, she says, if you think that you know if you when you die i'm not going to be able to take care of the children run the house and all of that don't think like that because i'm really skilled and you know uh, weaving and and sewing and things and i can make a living for us and i can take care of the children and she goes through this one thing after another you might think this but it's exactly what you did for yourself mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you might think that this is going to be a problem, but I can tell you, it's not going to be a problem. I, I'm going to handle it. So thank you to your sister. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a good thing to do for one another. Mm -hmm. It's also pretty humbling, I think, to, to know that we're not like indispensable, you know, like mm. life goes on for everybody. When we pass away, they'll they have their own karma, they have their own set of conditions, you know, their minds and their orientations and what came before will affect everything else. So it's not like we're responsible for everything after we die also. <laughs> we're just responsible for right now for ourselves and what we're doing with our yeah. minds, with our body, speech and mind. And after that, it's like, you know, he, he, if you cling to it, you're just going to suffer more. <laughs> so let's just stop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Manoy. Hi, Nikki. Oh, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right, Derek? Yeah. Oh, I had all muted. I didn't realize you were speaking through the meditation. I thought, thought that was a long meditation. I don't know why. Um, I know, never mind. But I gathered it was on the death contemplation, which, um, and so then I was gathering my thoughts as people were talking actually about that. Um, yeah, yeah, quite similar to James actually. Some of that, I think there's a relief about death because I haven't found a lot of peace in this lifetime. I think I must have found more than I did in my last life. Oh. I, I, been really suffering then i can't imagine what i was like in the last last lifetime so I, I have found some peace at times which um i need to remember that because sometimes my mind will tell me that it's all suffering and it's not the case at all um i lost my dad two years ago and watched my um i hadn't seen them for 21 years my parents mm -hmm process circumstances and then I then he died but what was more more disturbing was my dad actually let go um and my mother was just 
it was bizarre and it was um she got really angry with my dad and shouting at him you can't leave me you can't leave me um oh it was awful and that was his last memory of her I just thought I was so angry at her for doing that I mean I know she was scared because she's been really reliant on him but it really showed me about how I just thought I don't want to be I don't want to leave that for those for my sons you know for my sons no way do I want them to I want them to know I'm all right to die and I want them to be all right with me dying actually um because it's gonna happen it's gonna happen I used to have this thing when I was younger when I used to think of my mum and dad dying and I'd get upset and I've seen my sons do that as well when they were younger just think of me dying and then um, but the, the thing I wanted to ask you about is my dad's gone and I did manage to see him three months before he died it was weird I went to see them because I knew one of them's gonna die I just knew that and I have, um, I did then try to reconnect with my family. I've got five brothers and sisters and my mum. It didn't go well. I can't do it. It's too difficult. It's, it's very, very painful. So, um, and I have a lot of guilt. That's what ra- arises in me is that if one of them dies, I'm, I have guilt that I was a bad something because I had to withdraw from them for so long. So, um, I mean, I have thought about writing to my mum because I've withdrawn again, you see. I withdrew for 21 years um, and then lots of reasons why. And then I went back, um, if you like, because my dad died. And then I've withdrawn again the last two years. I tried to and it was just too... I end up being the scapegoat of the family and I just can't do that anymore. Um, So, yeah, I don't know really what to do with that other than I just talk about it, I guess, to say I feel guilty. I do feel very guilty. Well, I have a suggestion. You can do good things and share the merit with them. You don't have to, you don't have to, I really believe we don't have to resolve things in relationships with the other person necessarily. I mean, a lot of the time, it's not really helpful to them. Um, And you can, you don't have to really resolve anything. I mean, the way they act and the way they treat you, if if you can let it go as much as possible, that's good. Just because you're related to somebody doesn't mean you have to be close. It's not like all all relationships are are equal (laughs) in that way. And, and But if you do, if you share the merit of good things that you do with them, and really, regardless of how unskillful they might be with regard to you, if you can bring up metta for them and and just kind of reorient your mind about it and not worry about not being there in their life, they're probably fine. I'm sure they've learned how to do their life without your presence. And that's okay. But if you keep wishing them well and you share merit with them, and you know, like even this coming to this meeting today, mm-hmm. no, you're doing something good. Yeah, I think good things all the time. I needed permission from someone <laughs> to do that. Uh, that's all. Because I think I'm doing something wrong. So just saying that was like, well, I'm all right with that. Yeah. Yeah. Think of their good qualities that they have. Like when when a bad memory comes up about what happened, whatever storyline it is, just like, nope, I'm just going to think about how good my brother plays guitar or whatever, you know, like something nice, something wholesome, a sweet thing they did for you once or something. And then think about your own good qualities too. Like, I did that nice thing for my mom once, or I did that nice thing for my sibling or whatever once, you know, and kind of, I like this reorienting your mind thing about it with meta and with um, turning your mind to the good side of it. If, if something bad comes up in your mind about it. That's great. (laughs) Thank you. That's really great. Thank you. Welcome. I think also has a hand up. Hello, Ling. Hello, Aya. Thank you so much um, for these wonderful teachings. 
Um, I actually um, enjoyed your uh, guided meditation. Um, I did feel a moment f uh, fearful when you said no future. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, oh, how about my son? He's mm. 13 years old. Um, but I did have, um, I have to tell you a little bit of my experience. Um, I got divorced when he was two and a half. And I really thanked to Arjun Brahm and I read his book, Opening the Door of Your Heart. He basically saved my life. Um, mm. I think I really used um, that idea um, of, you know, each day is kind of my last day. I, I actually constantly tell my son I could die any time because, you know, I'm living in foreign country myself. I have no family is here. Anything could happen to me. Um, and that was really helpful for me in this, you know, past nine years. Mm -hmm. um, I developed more um, peace and more, um, much more faith in this path. Actually, was I'm sure I will on this path. Uh, my question is, um, you know, I don't know if it's, uh, I have a lot San Vega. <laughs> I think I have mm -hmm. this five um, daily um, remembrance uh, collection just on my wall and um, I read them very frequently, almost every day. And the last one, it's something always stuck on me. I, it says, you know, um, nothing belongs to us. The only thing belongs to me is the karma. The karma is the ground I stand. Um, that's my question comes to, and um, when I um, when I heard your teaching yesterday, and also often I was reflecting, and I said, I don't want to die time when I still resentful for someone who's hurting me. But I feel like I can't, you know, like when I today we even just walk, you know, doing something, I notice this feeling of oh, she hurt me. And I just I, you know, like doing the guided meditation was great, you know, I'm passing, you know, I can relinquish all this or whatever. But I was worried, you know, or something like at the moment I had this feeling why she hurt me why he hurt me or this resentment i don't mm -hmm. want to have them and i don't know if uh, it's just need a time determined practice or any way i can already help myself I hope. yeah i think i think there are a few things one one is to really think about their good qualities like i was saying also um and when you when you think when you think about how they hurt you, try to turn the mind away from repeating that thought all the time and think instead about, you know, what kind of pain a person has themselves when they hurt someone else. You know, try to think about where they are coming from or what they're struggling with that would cause them to not be kind. And you um, and you really do, I think it's good to. Uh, to very much want to let go of any resentments because it only holds us back. Um, and people do unkind things all the time, unkind or, um, you know, um, when I want to say we're just not aware of what we're doing, you know, like how we're impacting someone else and, you know, maybe irresponsible behavior or whatever. And to think about, think about that also, that this kind of stuff happens to people all the time. Someone's acting this way. And people act this way all over the world. And, and sometimes I think, well, I'm not worried when it happens to someone else. I don't think about that. I'm only focused on it because it's me. <laughs> you know. And so how can I let that go and just realize that this is how life is? You know, there are those times when people are unkind or they're disrespectful, or they're disregarding us, whatever it is. And if I can set that aside and not take it personally, then I don't keep it going. And I, I'm the one who, am, who is freed from that. So in the suttas, the Buddha also says, think about if the person says things that are unkind, think about the good things that they do. Or if they do bad things and they say bad things, think about other things that, you know, maybe they can do. Maybe they are sometimes kind to someone else, whatever it is. Or 
if you can't think of anything good about them, then really have compassion for them. The, the Buddha compared it to seeing someone traveling on foot down the long road with far from the city that was before or the one that's coming and they're sick and think, I hope that they get to the next town and they find some help. And it's like, think of them in that way. It's their, it's their, um, their loss really that they would act unkindly and it's their suffering that they are acting from or their conditioning like Ajahn Brahm talks about how we're all so preconditioned that we just follow in those in those ways and and we do things that are unskillful and I myself know that for my own self really try to um to see if we can let that go yeah thank you so much yeah keep working on it because yeah don't carry that burden <laughs> yeah you're welcome hi alan hi 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 Thank you for the talk and the guided meditation. Uh, it's my first time to the group, so thank you. I found it really helpful. I've just got two questions for you. I found it incredibly emotional uh, going through that process. I've never, I've never been through a, a guided meditation on death before, and and it was really full on for me. And and I don't know what your response to it. and and it wasn't emotion about the fact that I was just letting go. It was emotion. That was just rising up within me. It was like a, 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 a comforting emotion, and and I don't know if that's to be encouraged or to be denied. And and then once we get through the meditation, I, I, as I went through the process of genuinely trying to let go in my mind of relationships, the first thing I thought about was when I see my family again, I want to really enjoy and appreciate that time that I've got with them. And I don't know whether that's then reinvesting in the, those relationships to the extent I don't want to let them go. So mm. there's conflict there. I uh, just wonder your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, um, my thought, maybe you'll have some too, but my first thought about the emotion is to not, not deny it or encourage it, just, just allow it to unfold as it will naturally and observe it. And don't worry about it. I think I think it's totally fine and understandable. And it probably is the sign of some some things um, relaxing and and really letting go of some things that we hold that we don't even know we're holding. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's all fine and and to just just be present with this when it arises or if it arises again and it's okay. Um, and this, I think the idea of when you come back together with your family and you really enjoy being with them is great. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. What we wanna watch out for is when we're getting attached and how we know is that we start worrying about their welfare. You know, like if we, if we think um, I'm really worried something's gonna to happen to them, then we, then we should follow up with that thought of how, Everyone has their comma and everyone will go through all kinds of experiences. And we have to just be as supportive as we can be and, and to try to let go of any wanting it to be different than it is. And it, as long as we practice with it like that, yes, by all means, enjoy being with your family, be loving and kind and enjoy their kindness and their love and, and not, and not get um, attached to wanting them to be different or wanting you to be different. I mean, yeah, we're practicing, we're all practicing to grow, but you know, just, just not getting caught up in, in desires and aversions. Just enjoy, just enjoy them. Thank you, that was fantastic. Did you have anything you wanted to say? No, okay, that was great. <laughs>
Hi, David. Hi. I had a bit of an odd experience last year. I was getting really stressed out with everything going on in my life. Everything became too much to handle. And then I fell unconscious. And when I was unconscious, it felt like the most calming, contented feeling I'd ever experienced, possibly because I was free from all life's concepts. But it just felt so nice. And I was a bit regretful when I came conscious again. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a really nice feeling. Yeah, that's just kind of the comment, really. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Meditate and get to that place. <laughs> it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> in meditation, when you get to that point where you don't have control over anything and you're just observing and you're not, you know, there's there's nothing you need to do. It might be similar. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, David. I will ask Anne to unmute as well. Thank you. Have I unmuted? Mm -hmm. No, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Well, just just an observation to see what you think in, in the contemplation of death in meditation, whether sometimes it's also helpful as a balancing factor to, um, to recollect the Buddha also taught the deathless, so that um, often, I mean, I have used the meditation on death as a fairly regular practice, but I also quite like to reflect upon the, the, the Nibbana Sutra, really, um, you know, the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed, for anyone who doesn't know the Sutra, and I just, I don't know whether that's seeking comfort or just balancing out like people have talked about sometimes the fears and the anxieties the the concerns with dying and the death of other people to kind of recollect it isn't just about death does that make sense oh yeah mm -hmm. totally and i'm so, so glad you brought it up because it's our job to kind of keep talking about nibbana and the path to nibbana so <laughs> we didn't say it yet <laughs> and that's really um yes reflecting on the nibbana element it's sometimes called in in the suttas you know where you're really you're really orienting yourself towards the deathless towards the complete stilling of all formations and the letting go of all greed hatred and delusion and the complete peace and ultimate happiness absolutely and you know putting our attention on that is a is the fundamental mm, motivation or draw or, or or inclination of the practice and so yes yes absolutely thank you for for throwing in that vital ingredient <laughs> <laughs> so eloquently too that yeah was it was well beautiful <laughs> i love i love this collaboration thing yeah. we're doing you know <laughs> yeah thank you it looks like we're about time's about up maybe we could chant a blessing <laughs> What do you think? I'm going to put on original sound because I think it might sound a little better. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. 
by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Sangha. May you ever be well. Thank you all very much for all your practice and your attentiveness and and um, I hope that however the rest of this life unfolds, it's a continue, continuing um, path to Nibbana and full freedom. Aww. <laughs> And I and we would like to express our gratitude to you both for being here with us and for your generosity throughout the year because you've been at least once or twice every month <laughs> to teach us while Venerable Chand has been away. And it's been wonderful to have your teaching, your guidance, your inspiration, your presence. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, and thank you for keeping it running for Anukampa, everybody who's been involved. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're really excited for you having uh, Aya Chanda back and Ajahn Brahm coming out. And I hope you all get a chance to absorb lots of good Dhamma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like to invite everybody to have a look at the two websites that I posted in the chat, karunabv.org for Aya Santusika and Aya Chitananda's monastery and all of the teachings that they give will be posted on there, I'm sure. And also the anukampaproject.org website where you can also look at the events and find out more about the upcoming tour of the UK with Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda. And I'll remind you in two weeks time, Venerable Chanda is back from the first time after her retreat and she will be giving her first talk on the 30th of October between 9 and 10.30 UK time. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. It's a bit of a different time that week, but if you're able to join, it would be great to see you. And otherwise, we hope to see you at future events and hopefully in person in November. And thank you again, both Ayas, for being here with us again. My pleasure. Yeah, sure. All right, take care, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah, have a good night.